JBN, we keep you informed. The rise and fall of Donald C. Phipps, part one. Most Jamaicans consider Duns and Garrisons a main reason we are one of the world's most murderous countries. Our political leaders largely pretend they don't exist. The Spangler Posse was created by Glenford Early Bird Phipps, allegedly with the support of the leader of the People's National Party, PMP. Phipps surrounded himself with family members to lead the gang. His brothers, Carl and Donald Zeke Phipps, were respectively named underboss and the chief enforcer, while his cousins, Toywell, otherwise called Cow, and Bulby Phipps were sent to New York to oversee the operations of the gang on the spot. In 1977, Chief Glenford Early Big Phipps and the two of his bodyguards were killed by rival posse soldiers. From then, Donald Zeke Phipps took control of the Spangler Posse. His popularity grew quickly as he achieved strong connections with influential politicians. Zeke kept a low profile, but everyone in Kingston knew he was the true leader of one of the largest gang in the country, and hundreds of men obeyed his orders. He enjoyed great impunity in the 1990s and quickly ran his operations until the government was placed under pressure by the United States government. And so Donald Zeke Phipps came to national attention on September 23, 1998, when he was detained for 48 hours by the police for questioning on suspicion of attempted murder, wounding with intent and illegal possession of a gun. In retaliation, the entire downtown Kingston area was locked down by irate residents who rioted by blocking roads, lighting debris, and demonstrating. A young soldier was killed in the melee. Only after the intervention of their boss, who came out to speak to them, was the crowd appeased. On September 25, 1998, Zeke was charged with illegal possession of a gun, wounded with intent and attempted murder, and given bail in the sum of $250,000 in the gun court. The trial began in the Supreme Court on March 1, 1999, and on March the 2nd, he was acquitted after his attorney, K. Churchill Nita, entered a no-case submission. By May 5 of the same year, Ziggs was charged with malicious destruction of property and two counts of assault after two men were held and beaten after they were allegedly caught extorting money in his name. By June 21, the case was adjourned senior day when he appeared in the corporate area resident magistrate's court. Zeke turned himself over to the Kingston Central Police and was questioned for several hours on Thursday, May 2003, in an apparent effort to quell rumors that he was behind the raising of the Jubilee Market at West Parade on the night of Monday, April 28. As word spread that Zeke was in police custody, tensions mounted in his Matthews Lane stronghold and other areas of the oldest section of the city. A small crowd converged at the police station, raising fears that it could swell into a major demonstration and the kind of rioting that erupted for three days in September 1998. But the police easily dispersed the crowd and unlike during the 1998 incident, did not have to resort to the controversial and much criticized tactic of bringing Zeke to a balcony and giving him a bullhorn to assure supporters that he was unhurt. A large detachment of cops on the mobile reserve unit was visible just inside the front gate of the Kingston Central Police Station and two police armored personal carriers were outside. Persons in the downtown business district claimed that young men were earlier telling store operators to shut their doors early, but relented when it emerged that Zeke had not indeed been arrested. Zeke, who in the past has kept a low profile, despite his reputation as a so-called community leader, took the unusual step of issuing a public statement that he had turned himself into the police. It was a move to clear my name, Zeke said on letterhead that bore his alias and email address. After spending about five hours in a room on the top floor of the Flying Squad building with Martin and other members of the police top brass, he was released. Police in armored vehicles, jeeps and patrol cars roamed through sections of downtown Kingston. On Wednesday, September 1, as rumors swirled that reigning Matthews Landon, Donald Six Phipps, had been given 48 hours to leave the area. The ultimatum was issued ostensibly by one of his former strongmen. 
tension filled the humid downtown air as vendors packed their wares and some businesses closed early. Zeke's, surrounded by supporters at Matthews Lane, was moved to tears as he told reporters that he had heard arguments that he was behind the death of a man who was murdered more than two weeks ago and buried on Tuesday, August 31. It's just rumors. Them says me, them says me son. But me don't know what them saying, the tearful Don said. But still he was taking no chances. He told reporters as he puffed on his chillum pipe. His comments making it clear that any attempt against them would result in a full-scale clash. I still don't take the threat light. And all do I believe in Jah, me not into the Jesus Christ thing. Because if a man lick me on my face, me not going to turn the next side of my face. Zeke said. A relative of the murdered man, who the police say is a former Matthews Lane strongman, would fall out of grace with his associates, as this now assumed to be close to men from nearby Tivoli Gardens, is believed to have sent the threat. Five persons were shot and injured after violence erupted in downtown Kingston on Wednesday, October 13, 2014, after men aligned to Zeke's clash with men who defected from Matthews Lane a few months earlier. Rumors that Zeke was among those either killed or injured fueled tension in the oldest section of the Jamaican capital, where several stores closed early and the street vendors pulled down stalls and fled in the face of the mid-morning shooting. Zeke told the observer that he was not in the area where the shooting reported to be between his community and the nearby Tivoli Gardens broke out and had only heard of the violence. Me just hear some people get shot, he said in an interview via mobile phone. That's all me know. Me never dare which part things take place. You hear Sir Zeke get shot to not not do me. Me cool. Zeke also appealed for peace between the Matthews Lane area where people vote mostly for the ruling People's National Party PMP and Tivoli Gardens which is fiercely loyal to the opposition Jamaica Labour Party. According to the police and witnesses, the shooting broke out at about 9.30 a.m allegedly with men from Tivoli Gardens and Matthews Lane trading bullets with high-powered rifles. The police were informed that men heavily armed were seen in the North Street and other sections of downtown Kingston, said Superintendent Gary Griffiths, who was responsibility for the Kingston Western Police Division. They were exchanging shots. When the police went in, of course, they dispersed. By October 17, 2004, Zeke was detained and questioned by the police after they found $9 million in U.S. and Jamaica currency at his house, as well as ganja, ammunition, and pharmaceuticals at a shop he runs in the community. The police reported that Zeke was being questioned as how he came into possession of $6.3 million Jamaican dollars and U.S. $43,000 or $2.6 million Jamaican dollars. The money, the police said, was found in a safe at Zeke's house. He was also being questioned under what circumstances he came in possession of 26 rounds of .45 ammunition. Zeke was held without bail after he alongside 70 others from his downtown Kingston base were rounded up and carted off to jail. Most of those detained have been released, but five remained in custody without charge, one for questioning on a drug-related matter and four for suspected involvement in gun-related offenses. One of the four is to face an identification parade, for the shooting of Kamal Duffus, the nephew of Victor Rooster Patterson, whose murder the police theorized has led to the breakdown of a fragile peace that had been brokered between Matthews Lane and Tivoli Gardens. According to the police, those released were found to have originated from various parts of Jamaica, including St. Thomas, Spanish Town in St. Catherine, and Rockford, Kingston. We had nothing to link any of them with any crimes, so we had to release them. Deputy Superintendent Delroy Hewitt, head of operations at the Kingston West Police Division, said, Zeke's, who has been charged with illegal possession of ammunition and possession of and dealing in ganja, is booked to appear before the Corporate Area Criminal Court on Wednesday and Friday, October 22, to answer separately to the charges. Despite a heavy security presence, Zeke's was not brought to court to answer charges of illegal possession of 26 rounds of ammunition and possession of marijuana. It was not brought because of security reasons, said Sergeant Jubert Llewellyn. When Zeke was brought before the corporate area resident magistrate's court, he was offered bail in the sum of $1.5 million, but he was unable to take up the offer as the passport he had in his possession had expired. 
Zix was ordered by presiding judge Judith Pusey to give his fingerprints to the police, report to the Kingston Central Police Station on Tuesdays, Thursdays and Saturdays between the hours of 6 a.m. and 8 p.m. and to surrender his travel documents as conditions of bail. But the so-called era Dawn could not provide a valid passport after spending hours in the holding area of the halfway tree court and was carted off in a truck assigned to transport prisoners to the remand center. Zeke's a police source said, told officers that his passport was in the possession of an embassy as he had planned to visit a foreign country. His attorney, K. Churchill Nita, was confident, however, that his client would be out on the streets as soon as a valid passport was handed over to the authorities. There's a itch in relation to his travel document, but they are working to sort it out, Nita said. Earlier, Nita told the court that he thought the conditions of bail to be oppressive and asked the court to relax the conditions of reporting to the police three times weekly. Nita pleaded that his client was a businessman who lived at Matthews Lane and was not planning to abscond. His request was denied by Aaron Pusey, who told the attorney that the charges against his client were very serious. These are serious allegations. It is a large quantity of ganja, plus the offenses under the Firearms Act. The conditions stand, Pusey told the lawyer. The police said they went into the Matthews Lane area on Sunday and at about 3.15 p.m. entered a grocery store called the Sons of the Lane on Haywood Street, which is owned by Phipps. Phipps was summoned and shown a search warrant after which he opened the doors to the establishment. According to the prosecution, Phipps was in the company of his common-law wife, Tanya Williams, and requested that the police search the premises in Williams' presence. The police, the court was told, complied, and when the shop was searched, ganja weighing about two pounds was found along with 13 bottles of hydrocortisone, three bottles of another unnamed substance, and 26 rounds of .45 cartridges in a bag on top of a bucket. The cops say Phipps denied ownership of the ammunition, but admitted to possession of the ganja and chemicals. A stop order was also made against him at all ports to prevent any attempts by Phipps to take flight. Phipps was scheduled to return to court on November 2, 2004. Almost $9 million in local and United States currency, which the police took from Zeke's in October, was returned to him, with no additional charges laid on the so-called Matthews Lane area leader. Although Zeke's could not explain who came by the money, his attorney K. Churchill Nita said the police had no basis on which to keep the cash. After flouting his bail conditions, Zeke's got a warning from resident magistrate Kisok Lang to comply or be jailed. The so-called Don was ordered by the court to report to the Kingston Central Police Station every Tuesday, Thursday and Saturday between the hours of 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. as a condition of bail but police say he has not been compliant with the order. Zeke's dressed in a blue suit and black shoes had his 1.5 million bail extended until May 18 but not before Lang issued a strong warning to the balding Don. Mr. Phipps, your bail is extended under the same conditions. If you fail to conform to the conditions of your bail, you'll be remanded in custody. I am sure you know the implications of that, he advised Phipps, who glared at the judge before walking defiantly from the courtroom, followed by a small band of supporters. His lawyer assured the magistrate that he would ensure that his client complied with the court's order. The fall of Donald Zeke Phipps. The Matthews Lane area leader Donald Zeke Phipps was arrested on suspicion of double murder on Wednesday, May 18, 2005 by senior cops from the Criminal Investigation Bureau headquarters after he appeared in the corporate area resident magistrate's court on other charges filed against him late 2004. But unlike seven years ago, when his arrest for attempted murder, illegal possession of a gun and unlawful wounding sparked a riot downtown, the capital's main commercial district remained calm. Soldiers, police and civilians were seen at Beeston, Haywood and Charles Streets engaging in live conversation while other security personnel combed that section of the city. Deputy Commissioner of Police Mark Shields said Phipps was a suspect in the gruesome murder and burning of Rodney Farkison and Dayton Williams on April 18. Farkison and Williams, also known as Scotchbright, were shot in their heads and their bodies taken to an open lot at Rose Lane and torched. 
the police see a trail of bloodstains from a building on Matthews Lane to the open lot at Rose Lane led them to believe the men were killed at Matthews Lane. Minutes after Phipps' arrest, a large detachment of police and Jamaica Defense Force JDF soldiers, led by head of the anti-crime task force, Senior Superintendent Donald Pusey, swooped down on the Matthews Lane area and conducted searches of the area. During the operation, the police found an Enforcer M1 machine gun and two magazines with ammunition. Zix was held and shackled by the cops as he was preparing to leave the court building. When Zix appeared in the halfway tree gun court to answer to the charges of double murder, the police objected to a bail application saying they had DNA evidence as well as a recorded telephone conversation relating to the case. Dressed in a pair of blue jeans and a red polo shirt, the Matthews Lane strongman, who was brought to court in handcuffs and under heavy police guard, had a calm yet melancholic disposition before was taken before resident magistrate Judith Pusey. Zeke was taken into police custody nearly two weeks before, is charged with the April 15 murders of Dayton Scotchbright Williams and Rodney Farkison, who were shot in their heads and their bodies taken to an open lot at Rose Lane, downtown Kingston, and set afire. The police had earlier reported that bloodstains were seen along Matthews Lane and Rose Lane the morning the bodies of the two men were discovered. The police had asked for two or three weeks to complete their investigations. They need to get more statements, defense attorney K. Churchill Nita QC told reporters after the court proceedings. Zeke's was remanded in custody when he reappeared in the Supreme Court to answer murder charges on Monday, October 25, 2005. A large crowd of supporters from the tiny enclave of Matthews Lane, downtown Kingston, cheered loudly as the reputed strongman who is facing two murder charges in the deaths of Dayton Scotch Bright Williams and Rodney Ferguson was led away from the court. Government prosecutors asked the court for more time in the case against Phipps and Garfield Williams, who had also been charged with two counts of murder and is out on $1 million bond. Senior Deputy Director of Public Prosecution Paula Llewellyn, who is leading the state's case, told Justice Marva McIntosh that while more than 90% of the documents involved in the case had been completed, a few were still outstanding. But the Crown's reason did not sit well with Defence Counsel K. Churchill Nita. In fact, Nita requested that his client be granted bail, arguing that his client's health had deteriorated badly since his incarceration. Nita told the court that Phipps had been in custody since May and the 48-year-old era leader had no previous convictions. He said Phipps also had strong ties to the community, which included commercial and family ties. Stay tuned for part two when we conclude the fall of Donald Ziggs Phipps. JBN, we keep you informed. Please remember to like, subscribe, share, leave us a comment and click the notification bell to receive our daily uploads.